everyone. I am here with uh, Leon Leon Constantine, um, ex ex professional, um, also now working in the agency business. Um, and we we are here today to introduce you to Leon, to our guest today. Um, Leon has made over three hundred and fifty six professional appearances, scoring over ninety one goals, um, spreading um, spreading um, nineteen clubs between 2000 and 2017, um, where he started off his early life, um, pretty much coming from Hackney, um, but of Jamaican parentage, playing for clubs such as Edgeware Town, um, to, to Millwall, to, to Leighton Orient, um, Hardwick Thistle, Brentford, Southend United, um, Peterborough United, um, Torquay United, uh, Port Vale, Leeds United, Oldham Athletic, Northampton Town, Cheltenham Town, Hereford United, York City, Braintree Town, Lewes, Tooting and Mitcham United, Boston United, Arsley, Brimston, Enfield Borough. The people that would be familiar with all of these clubs. But I just want to welcome you um, to the, to the Continental Spire Soccer TV podcast. Um, Leon, um, great to have you on here, man. You know, it's good, 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 good to be on there with you as well, mate. When I looked, well, I knew growing up as a kid, if you were from Northern Ireland, for example, I knew kind of growing up during the Troubles, you know what I mean? I knew growing up, like, if you were to go across to England, number one, you're coming from Northern Ireland. <laughs> number two, if you got across to England, you know what I mean? As a professional, you had to work harder because you weren't given, you were given a harder ride. You would have to work a lot harder you would have to do a lot yeah. more than just a, an English lad would do there. And I think when you're coming from abroad versus if you're local, you're always given preference because you're local. Yeah. So, so you always have a, that upper hand. But then you look at, if you then look at, for example, if you look at like the racial side of football, um, and obviously I've spoken to many people about this um, in this space, people at the FA, um, I've asked their opinion on it. Um, and obviously, I've obviously listened to people like David Icke. I always like to look at the conflicting, the people who are in conflict, the people yeah. who are. And, you know, if you look at, like, for example, we look at Raheem Sterling and we look at guys like Troy Townsend working um, in terms of to represent black players within professional football. Um, and and also, it's interesting because obviously my wife, she, she's Russian. Um, and so I see a lot of, I suppose, the... the I suppose how they're viewed. Um, do you know what I mean? Because they're not from here, so they're viewed as immigrants. They're they 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 can suffer abuses at times, and so I'm seeing this firsthand. And but also being in football, I see it even more. Um, mm. And and so I just want to actually ask you on that. What are your what are your thoughts, kind of in terms of why Raheem Sterling has been kind of earmarked and why people. Do you think he's doing a good job in terms of how he's representing black players and obviously all the stuff that happened to him at Chelsea last last season? Because I know the agency you're a part of, you guys have got white guys in there, you've got black guys in there, you know what I mean? I think, right, first of all, I think Raheem Sterling is um, unreal. I think it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, the way he's represented not just black players, but mm -hmm. football. Right. In general, he's is amazing. Right. Do you know what I mean? And I, I commend him for all that he's done and that he continues to do. Um even now. Um I think Gareth Southgate has been fantastic right. for Raheem Sterling and for the England team in general which is mostly why they're playing their better football. Right. More black players are getting opportunity within England now through right. Gareth Southgate. Mm. I think the reason that is, remember, Gareth Southgate experienced first-hand victimizations when he missed that penalty. Yeah, absolutely. So he knows exactly what it's about. He knows how the country dealt with him right. as a white player. Yeah, but you, what you need to remember as well, Gareth Southgate grew up in the changing rooms alongside Ian Wright, Mark Bright, John Solarco. Yeah, so he knows how to 
he mostly understands and he's grown up, you know, with black players through his own career. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, I commend him on the way he's made the whole England team accessible mm -hmm. to young kids. All the adverts, you know, doing the little jugbacks with the kids and all that. Because most England managers prior to him, mm -hmm. the first thing they do is they lock the England team away from the public because they're worried about stories getting leaked and everything like that. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. Yeah. They, you know, right. Okay. This is England camp. Don't talk to the press. Don't do this. Don't do it. Gareth Southgate's completely done the opposite. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And it, that's why the last tournament, the whole nation got behind them because we all felt like we was part right. of this journey, which is, how it should be. <laughs> right, right. Do you know what right. I mean? Absolutely. Yeah? Um, the racist, what Troy does, I think a lot of people um, mm. are against Troy for the mm. wrong reasons. I think mm. Troy is highlighting the things that ha are happening. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, with all the social media and, you know, different, ca there's more racism, blatant racism now then there was, like before, it was kind of, you know, a bit under the, un undercover. There was always racism, we always know that, but, you know, mm. it was done in different ways. Mm. Now, it is so blatant, mm. yeah, like, you know as a supporter, you're going to a game. Right. Especially at a big club like Chelsea. You know, every single camera is going to be there. What makes you feel you can abuse or racially abuse a player and get away with it? So yeah. you already know this before you go to the game. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, my thing on the racism thing is, I don't understand. Like, so I talked to for the, one of my colleagues I work with at the agency. Yeah. Because I said, we're all ex-teammates. That's why we had such a good bond. Yeah. Mm. And he said to me, Leon, especially with the Raheem Sterling situation, mm. if someone had called you that, yeah, I would have reacted before you did. Mm. Mm. Because you're my teammate. So first and foremost, I'm going to defend you. Yeah? Because in football, if you can't make that tackle, Nick, yeah? Mm. As a teammate, I'm meant to cover for you. Right. Right. Yeah? Mm. So my thing is, when Raheem Sterling got abused, where are the white players? coming out saying, hold on a minute, that, that ain't right. You can't talk to my teammate like that. Well, why do you think that? I mean, you know, you know, that, you know, when you, when you obviously just talk, that baffles me because I just think, I don't get that. <laughs> I don't understand why, um, I don't understand why that, why that didn't actually take place. Now, obviously, you know, Fabian Delph, he's a good friend of yours. Um, yeah. And you guys, obviously, you were at Leeds with him. And obviously, you know, I mean, did you speak, do you ever speak to him about that? Because obviously he was on the, I think he was on the pitch, I think. He was playing a left back. back I, ha I, haven't, I haven't spoken to him. Um, I haven't spoken to him about it, um, to be fair. Mm. But he's good people, man. I think when you're dealing with the racist side, we spoke about this before, Nick. Yeah. In order to hit the masses, which the masses are predominantly white, okay, you need mm. a white person, yeah, to come out and speak. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Because, like I said to you, if you're teaching black history and a white yeah. guy comes in to teach black history, is he going to reach the people that he's trying to reach more than maybe a black teacher? Right. Yeah, because he's you know, more, yeah. He's got more reach. Because yeah, I would agree with that. Exactly. They're going to relate. It's, you know, they're going to relate to certain individuals. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Whether it's right or wrong, because you might both be saying the same information. Okay. But it's just the way, you know, society is. So in the football side, why don't they, and I, I spoke to Troy about this, maybe get, you know, just getting, you know, four ex-black players to talk about racism and why it shouldn't happen or why, you know, why it is happening or why it shouldn't, 
it's just going through one ear and out the other. Right. You know, we need to get some of these top players, you know, maybe a Steven Gerrard, maybe a Wayne Rooney. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because mm. all of these guys, they're very close with these, with their teammates. Like, do you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with them to come out and speak on, on the topic. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're trying to address, we're not trying to hide or get anyone in trouble. You're trying to address the situation. Right. Because I know me growing up where I grew up in a multicultural society. Mm. Yeah. I've got, you know, loads of white pals, Asian pals, black pals, whoever, Turkish, Cypriot, whatever. Like, if you was to verbally attack one of my friends, mm. I'd be, I'd, I'd jump in. Absolutely. I'll jump in. Take a stand, basically. Hundred percent. And it doesn't matter what colour you are. Yeah. I'm talking. You're my, like, and you know, with football, as as you know, your teammates, you're in that dressing room. You mean you spend more time with your teammates than you do your own family. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have a certain bond. Okay. Mm. And I don't think there's anything wrong with people coming forward, and you know, addressing that situation. Right. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and yeah. saying like, no, that's that. Nah, 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 nah. You know what I mean? And we're going to walk off. We all walk off. Right. Like, this is our game. Yeah, I we think, come think... here to perform for you. You know what I mean? Like, we don't need to be coming to games. Like, it's a game at the end of the day. What does colour have to do with anything? Whether you have a bad game or a good game. Yeah. You know the you know the opinion where people form an opinion um, and they form it towards um, they form it towards especially like with um, black players especially where they'll get where they'll get like um, comments like you know um, he's got an attitude. I remember speaking to my head of my head of coaching at, at CAS. You know, and one of the things that he said to me, he said, "Oh Nick, I dealt with this one player, but the player the player was white." <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm. He probably gave a worse attitude, but there seems to be the stigma. But I also think that, you know, and it's funny, I was listening to David Icke because he was talking about um, the narratives and how the media sets a narrative up to feed oh. it, to, to, to feed. And it's actually not white people. It's not generally not white people because I think most white people, I know for me, most of the people that I'm very close with, a lot of those people are back, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, in many areas, and so, but I think what he's saying is that if you go against that narrative, um, for example, and the powers that be, do you know what I mean? It, it's so strong that you you will you will be marginalised. And one of the things that he says, which I thought was really really fascinating, he says, but then if somebody he actually said if racial abuse is happening, and this is what he thinks he said. He was speaking to Dan Rose from Real, which is a very very good interview. And one of the things that he said, he said. Imagine something isn't happening at that point. Then you could actually be covering racial abuse. But if people say certain things at times and where they look at it, he said, then you, you, you may actually miss the issue because the media has, is painting up and, and saying that, it, that there's no racial abuse when really there actually is. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? And, well, this is so two, two, two you know? points. You, yeah, two points you made there. One of them is one I, we, we spoke about earlier, okay? Mm -hmm. Some of these guys in grassroots that deal with these kids in inner city areas, mm -hmm. yeah, will have more of an understanding about these kids mm -hmm. than what some of these guys who are in academy jobs. Right. As I said, right. they go with the narrative, oh, he's got an attitude problem. Ah, oh, he's got a chip on his shoulder. Right. Okay? Where some of these guys haven't. They haven't. Do you know what I mean? They're perfectly fine. You know what I mean? It's just because you don't know how to deal with them. That's all. Right. You know what I mean? And because you don't want to take the time to, to understand that person. Right. Straight away. Mm. You, you, you know, you just tarnish him as having an attitude problem. So. Yeah. My thing is, and this is what happens a lot in football. So, for instance, you sign Balotelli. Right. Yeah? Right. Now, you come and speak to me as your chief exec and say, look, I want 40 million out of the budget to sign Balotelli. Now, you know everything that comes with Balotelli. Right. Yeah? Right. 
then he does one thing wrong and all of a sudden everyone turns their back on him. Right. Now, mm. what happens to the support? Why not try and get the best out of him? Like, why not, like, come, like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you go yeah, and take, four, if, you, if I'm a chief exec and you take 40 million pound out of my budget, yeah, mm. you better get the best out of him. Right. And that's the bottom line. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. But what happens, no one wants to take on the baggage or the problem. Mm. Right. No one don't want to do it. Do you know what I mean? Right. Absolutely. Okay. And that is, that is an issue that you have within right. football. And it's that bridging, like you said, bridging the gap between, you know, the, the um, grassroots coach who might not have any qualifications or badges, yeah, but he can deal with um, the characters of players who come through from grassroots better than most really that player who leaves from a grassroots club, goes into an academy system, has bags and bags of talent, but never ever gets to deliver his potential because the people who are coaching him don't understand him. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's a massive niche in football that if they got it right, you would find more talent will get developed and expressed, get to express themselves than the ones that get, you know, you know, left by the wayside. So you look at someone like Ravel Morrison. Mm. Yeah. If he'd have had someone that could take him under, you know, their wing and say, look, you know, you, you look at Paul Gascoigne. Not just, not just talking about play. Look at Paul Gascoigne. Yeah. Alex Ferguson says it to this day. Had he had gone into Man United, where he had the good influences of Gary McAllister and... Um, um, Gary Pallister, yeah. Gary Steve Pallister Bruce. and um, um, and Steve Bruce. Mm. He would have known how to conduct himself as a professional. Most mostly a lot better than he did going to Spurs. Yeah. Where he got handed a house, he got all, he got more stuff from Tottenham, but at the end of it, it was more detrimental to his career. Yeah. And him as a person, the new idea had gone to Man United, where he would have had that support network of someone that understands him, where he comes from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, won't allow him to do the things that he got away with when he went to London. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would, I would agree. I would agree with that. I mean, I think that when you're looking at when you're looking at um, just what a pl- what a player kind of needs, and I know that um, when I've spoken to really pl- people that have a proven track record in youth development, people are looking at um, just the talent. But it's not really about the talent. It's really about it's really about helping them as as people. You know what I mean? Before, well, before exactly. Lau Taylor is the same. You know. Mm-hmm. He scored back to back double figures for the last six seasons. Right. Yeah. Right. I've only been working with him for three years. Right. So he's was doing what he's doing, maybe not to the level he's doing it now, but he was doing and scoring goals right. before. But the support and someone trying to help him and support him and understand him as a person wasn't there. Right, which is mostly why it's only now people are starting to kind of accept him and actually open their eyes to the talent that he has as a footballer. Right. right. Now, if we didn't get involved with him as a company, mm. he might still be, you know, languishing around in, in, in League One. Right. You know, still waiting for that day that someone understands him as a person. Right. And that's why I say to you, Lee Bowyer has done a fantastic job because Lee comes from a multicultural um, environment. You know what I mean? And I think sometimes, you know, managers, I always remember managers, even if you had a little bit of a, you know, edge to you as a, as, as, as a person, as a character, yeah. you know, a manager will sit you down and say, listen, look, I've heard this I've heard that about you okay now you come in you do a good job for me yeah and I'll help you you come in and cause problems yeah and I'll be your biggest nightmare right 
as a player, you walk away and you think, you know what? Fair play, Gaffer. I'm going to give you my best. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Because you're not just going along with the norm. Oh, mm. this manager says he's a bad apple. Oh, you know what? I don't want, I don't want nothing to do with him now. Nah. You know what I mean? You look at Andy Cole. Andy Cole said it the other day. Mm. Alex Ferguson was the first manager he played under that didn't try to get into his head or try to, you know, mentally bully him because they've heard he had a bit of an attitude problem or he had this or he had that. He said Alex Ferguson just allowed him to be who he was and that's why he played his best football and became a Man United legend. You know, you know, you know when you're talking about that, right? And, and I think this is something that I think a lot of people um, misunderstand. And I think with, um, with black players, I think especially, they're, they're misunderstood. And I was speaking to a coach at Ajax, um, a good friend of mine. And one yeah. of the things that he said to me, um, and he was talking to me about the dynamic, because if you look at a lot of, how, pretty much, Ajax is very similar. It's very, there's a lot of Moroccan players who have grown up in Holland, a lot of um, Dutch players who are African or they're from yeah. Curaçao, or they're, they're Portuguese, or they come from these other places. And one of the things that he said to me in dealing with multicultures, he says that he says that you have to understand um, black communities, but you have to also understand Moroccan communities, and you have to understand all of these things, because they their cultures shape them, you know what I mean? The things yeah, you've got to understand. It's culture. like... Yeah, but they have, but that's the problem. Is he says that he says that when people get annoyed, he says it's due to it's usually down to ignorance because they they have a re flat refusal to understand the community that, that they actually come from, and that is going to come into the footballing culture that you're a part of. Yeah. And he said yeah. that needs to be embraced, but he said you need to then understand that. And he like what you said, um, um, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson didn't um he didn't judge him, and I think. It's people being too quick to judge. Would you agree that that is the narrative that the media hundred percent? You know what I mean? Like I hear, you know, it's not just about you know black communities and people that come from you know inner city. It's like people, you know, it's like ah oh, ah, oh, this kid's from Surrey. He's soft. He hasn't got the like. Uh, yeah. What what does that That's actually funny. mean? Yeah, so right. Because right. he's from right. Surrey and he's fortunate to live in a nice area, he hasn't got anything about him, he can't be a good footballer, he can't be... Do you know what I mean? Is that not... Because that, that's just, a judgment as well, though, isn't it? Because... Yeah, it's a, judge, it's a yeah. judgment. And that's what I'm that's why I wanted to say, because it's a judgment on that side as well. Mm. Do you know it's what I mean? Harsh, yeah. Like, a lot of clubs now... And don't get me wrong, yeah, you're coming from, you know, you're coming from bad backgrounds and things like that, you know, maybe you've got that little bit more fight in you because you've got to fight for everything. Do you know what I mean? Like, I get that, but it doesn't mean that you can't get just as good talent or good players. Dealing with a player at the minute, you know, he, he comes from a very privileged background, but his hunger to become a footballer is mm -hmm. mostly more hungry than some of the players that I deal with at my academy who come from the same backgrounds that I came from. But they won't be think handed mm. to them. Mm. He wow. is willing. He doesn't want to rely on his dad, or he don't want to be. Oh, you know what? It doesn't matter. I don't want to play football because my dad's got money. He wants to be a footballer, right? Right. Do you know what I mean? And then right. I've got kids at my academy who can't be bothered to come training mm. because it's raining today, or oh, it's a bit cold. I, I, you know what I mean? Right. Right. You know. So what I'm trying to say. It, it, it's it's a bit of a a silly silly thing to judge individuals on where they come from because right. you know what I mean I've got kids who you think who come from a similar background to me in terms of the area they were brought up in mm. who haven't got as much fight to become a footballer as this right. kid has who come from a privileged background. Wow! But That's... then it can work it can work mm. vice versa because you've got some kids that come from a privileged background and as soon as you know the tables are going against them a little bit. Uh, I don't need to play football anyway. Right. Do you know what I mean? So I think so the point I'm making is all, it's all about you've mm. got to deal with individuals. And I think in football, mm. there's a lack of people within a club that deal with the individual person. Like, you know, how can I get the best out of this guy? Right. And when I was a kid, I felt like there was more of that. 
mm. at your disposal than there is now, even though there's flipping a hundred times more money involved in the game than when I was playing. Right. right. Do you know what I mean? I feel like the individual people that were there to support you as a young person, right. they were there. You know what I mean? And they did it not because they was getting paid. They did it because they just enjoyed football and they wanted to see you do well. Do you know what I mean? Right. I suppose within the racism that does exist in this country, it comes down to really the education and the fact that solutions are kind of coming out. But the thing is, is the media in, in the UK especially is, is very, very, very solid. And it's interesting because I've been watching a thing recently about um, the media in the court, you know what I mean? Media, how, how much the influence the media actually has. And that mm. they are quite reckless. And that there, there's no... And, and because there's so much money being made. Because if you stop racism, they're going to think, well, we can't really allow that to happen um, because then we wouldn't make any more money. Because the more racism we have, the would more you, stories would, there is. Would, yeah, would you would you say it just makes the tabloids just too much money, and the governments are also a direct part of that as well? That, that what? The, the yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if you want to get really deeper into it, then you know, yeah, you could, you could, you could, you could say that. Like, I think um, Sterling highlighted it perfectly with the two young players Foden buying his mama house, and I can't remember what the other, what a young black player who bought his mama house. And the, the two stories were so different. The young black player, oh, he's not even played a first team game, blah, 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 da, 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 splashed out this amount of money on the house. So then the white player who bought his mum a house is like, oh, you know, look what he's done with his money. He's tried to secure his, uh, 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 his parents. Uh, you know what I mean? He's like, a thank you for supporting him. And uh, you know what I mean, it was two different stories. And like you said, if you keep feeding that into, the, into society, Mm. Society straight away looks at that and they start right. to, you know what I mean? You got to remember, mm. even during this, this, um, you know, COVID, this lockdown, how easy it is to get people to all do the same thing. Right. You know, look at, no, the toilet roll touch challenge. Right. Everyone does the same thing. Right. Everyone's doing the TikTok. Everyone's doing, do you know what I mean? So, as a, as a social, you know, platform or the media, it's very easy to get people to think a certain way right. and to view people a certain way. Right. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. You yes. know, and it happens. And like you said, is it because it sells and it makes money? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, of course it does. Mm -hmm. Especially nowadays where, you can get more social platform. Everything's on online. Do you know what I mean? Are people buying papers like they used to? And it's it's the negativity. Like negativity just sells. It's um, it's it's high in demand. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. It's, it's high in demand. So I mean, when you look when you look through um a lot of what's actually going on um and the fact that Gareth Southgate has set that set the stall out for football. You know what I mean? As 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 obviously a, a profession. There's clearly, yeah. there's clearly inroads, there's clearly improvements been made, but there's just, and obviously with Raheem Sterling as well, um, yeah. and getting the support he's gotten, um, I think is has obviously been fantastic, you know? But it's yeah. just more things that kind of need to actually happen for, for radical change to, to come about. What do you think FIFA, where do you think they are in all of this? Do you, do you think they've been... What, where do you where do you think what do you think they need to do better? Where do I start? Mm. Jamie FIFA, the PFA, you know, like you talk you talk about grassroots, um, and you talk about John Terry, right? Um, talk about John Terry and what he's done for the grassroots team that he played for. Mm. So the PFA mm. take a slice of every single transfer. Right. Yeah? Right. So if Man United transfer someone for 100 million, yeah, element of that money goes to the PFA. Why can none of that money filter down to the grassroots club that actually developed these players in the beginning? 
Well, if you you know what's interesting. You know, with, if you want to yeah. keep if you want to if you want to keep grassroots football right alive, yeah. Mm. Why can't the money that the PFA take? We're literally not doing anything. They don't negotiate nothing for you, right? Right. They don't do anything like that. Okay. Mm. The pension scheme what they had was a load of rubbish, which is why so many pros, you know, like the Johnny Barnes and those people were in trouble come the end of their careers because the pension scheme wasn't that great. Right. Okay. Why can they not say, right, okay, you know what? We need to do more for grassroots football. Leon, if people want to reach out to you, where can they, where can they reach you? Um, I'm more active on Instagram. Okay. Which so, is my Instagram page is Leon Consta or Constantine's Academy. I've got okay. two. Okay. Um, on Twitter, um, I'm Leon Consta on Twitter as well. I don't really use Twitter as, as much. I should do. Okay. And I'm also on LinkedIn as well as, as okay. Leon Constantine as well. So, okay. you know, so people want to find me, they can, they, can, they, can, they can get me on that. So anybody that wants to reach out to Leon, he, we'll obviously put all his information up here. You can actually, you can actually reach, reach out to him. And also um, the agency handles for any aspiring um, footballers, parents have any questions. Um, Leon will always respond and the guys. Yeah. You know, we, what, SMI you, is the name of the agency. Okay. Um, SMI is obviously short for Sports Management International. Okay. Um, and like I like to say, we are the past the present and future of representation when it comes to footballers. Okay. So see on that, um, see on that, Leon, do you guys, uh, does SMI, do they have uh, any social where they can reach out, where they can reach out to you guys? Every, we're on all, all the social platforms. Um, SMI world, you can read, you can reach us all. It's myself, um, Marco Byrne, Kevin Gawley, Lee Matthews, Clayton Fortune, Luke Rogers, um, George Swan, Greg Abbott. We've okay. got, we've got, we've got, got uh, um, a very strong, diverse team. Okay. And like I said, all of us have been players. Okay. We've been teammates. Okay. So anybody that wants to get a hold of Leon, he'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. And um, hope any, any, any comments. Obviously, don't forget to follow us at at uh, Continental Aspire Shop. You can get us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, leave your comments in the in the section below. And uh, Leon, thank you very much for today. Um, it's been a real education um, for yeah. everyone, and hopefully everybody's enjoyed it. <laughs> it's been brilliant. It's been a pleasure.